Hello and welcome to the fifth lecture in this series. So, last time I had stopped at uh, the construction of a C infinity function with compact support. This time let me actually carry out the construction. So, it is uh, there are several steps involved. So, proof assume that n equals 1. So, all I want is a function from r to r which is c infinity and has compact support. All right. So, now assume that n equals 1. So, step 1 this is perhaps the main step in a sense. So, let us uh, so note that let f of x is equal to 0 if x less than or equal to 0 and is equal to e to the power minus 1 over x if x is greater than 0. So, this is the building block for what will follow. So, the graph of this function looks like this. Now, this uh, it is obvious that this f is c infinity, it is clear that f is c infinity at all points x not equal to 0. It is a small exercise to check that even at x equals 0 all derivatives of f exist. So, one can check all derivatives of f exist even at x equals 0 and this essentially hinges on the fact that recall that the definition of f involved an exponential and as x goes to 0 this 1 over x will go to infinity, but there is a negative sign. So, this will go to minus infinity. So, and we are exponentiating that. So, it will go to 0 very rapidly. In fact, so it will go to 0 very rapidly and so rapidly that if you multiply e to the power minus 1 over x by any power of x or rather divide by any power of x, still one can check that the numerator goes to 0 much faster than the denominator. So, therefore, the <coughs> the whole thing goes to 0. So, it is an elementary exercise to check this. Now, given this and of course, uh, it will follow that in fact, all derivatives and because f is identically 0 for x less than 0, if derivatives were to exist, it would they would be forced to be by looking at left hand derivatives, it would be it is immediately clear that all derivatives f k 0 equal to 0 for all k. That is uh, the main point is the existence of the derivative. Okay. Now, given this what I do next is step 2 for a greater than 0, let us take some real number. So, let f 1 x equals f of 
a minus x so in other words i just so the graph of this f1 is going to look like this so this is a so this is y equals f1 x and h of x is equal to f of x times f a x. So, I just multiply the two functions that I have obtained. So, the graph of h will look like well if x is less than 0 f of x is identically 0 if x is greater than a f a x is identically 0, but in between 0 and a both of these functions are non 0. So, therefore, this will look like something like this. So, this is y equal to h of x. And we have our C infinity function with compact support. Note that H is a C infinity function on R n with and in fact, we can exactly say what its support is with its support equal to the closed interval 0 to A. But we want to do something better than this. <coughs> I, what I want to construct is I want a C infinity function which is actually identically 1 in a smaller sub interval of 0 to a and 0 outside 0 to a. So, in order to ensure that this h becomes identically 1, so I, what I want is I want something like this becomes flat at the top and then descends to 0. So, let us say this is 1. So, I want something like this a C infinity function whose graph looks like this. There is a nice trick to accomplish that. So, that was step 2 step 3 let g of x equal to 0 to x h of t dt divided by 0 to a h of t dt, where h is the function which we had constructed earlier in the last step. So, this was h. Now, it is clear that uh, if x is greater than or equal to 1, then g of x is oh, not 1 sorry. Uh, if x is greater than or equal to a, if x is greater than or equal to a, the upper integral 0 to x I can split into two parts one is 0 to a and a to x. Well, if x is greater than a in between a and x, my function h is going to be 0 anyway. So, the it does not contribute anything. So, this will be identically 1. And if x is on the other hand, if x is less than or equal to 0, then g of x is if x is less than 0, this integral 0 to x becomes minus of integral negative of the integral from x to 0 but on the negative side h is 0 anyway. So, this is 0. 
So, this new function g has the form So, this is uh, for x less than this <coughs> and so this is a. So, it rises up maybe I should make it a bit more curved. and reaches 1. So, by step 3 uh, we seem to have somewhat regressed uh, I mean we had a C infinity function with compact support, but now I no longer have compact support because uh, <coughs> well it continues to be 1 for any x greater than a, but on the other hand I know that it becomes identically 1 after some time. So, this is good enough to get both things identically 1 on some portion and compact support. Now, what I will do is um, I had that A, I can continue to persist with A, but let me just take A equals 1 for convenience take a equals 1 and let g 4 I will use the subscript 4 x equals g of 4 minus x. So, the graph of this g 4 is going to look like this. So, I have the point 4 and I have the point 3 at the point 3 the function starts descending well. Okay, so, let me just redraw the whole thing. Yeah, this is better. So, this is g 4 x just for reference how I got this was that I mean by definition g of g 1 when I took a equals 1 then g of x itself was of this form. This is y, so this is y equals g 4 x, this was y equals g of x. So, the point is that this becomes identically 1 if x is greater than or equal to 1. So, here whatever is inside the brackets here. So, uh, right. So, this 4 minus x should be greater than or equal to 1 to ensure that this thing is identically 1. So, 4 minus x greater than 1 would amount to saying that x is less than or equal to 3. So, for yeah maybe I should change this a bit. So, it is not quite move it as move it a bit here. So, this is 3 it is not quite accurate I mean the scale is off, but Right. So, uh, when for so when x is uh, less than or equal to 3 this ident becomes identically 1 and when x is greater than or equal to 4 this thing becomes negative. So, it is 0. So, it looks like this. Then what we do is again repeat the same steps as in the earlier cases. Let k 1 x equals 
g of x times g 4 x. So, I multiply these two then we have a function which looks like this. So, the important points here are 1, 3 and 4. So, I will climb up to 1, continue on this flat top and descend back to 4. So, this is the graph of y equals k 1 x. Now, we are almost done. We have now have finally, have a C infinity function which is with compact support and which is identically 1 inside a smaller interval. But I will just do one more change, I will just shift it so that instead of uh, the graph looking like this <coughs> at these specific points, I want the center, uh, the graph to be centered around the origin. So, I will just do a translation. So, step 5, let k of x equals k 1 x plus 2. So, now the graph is going to look like this. So, this point would be minus 1, this point would be 1 and so on. Oh, sorry not quite this. actually this point would be 1 and this would be minus 1, this would be 2 and this would be minus 2. So, in other words k of x has the looks like this, then k of x is 1 if mod x less than or equal to 1 is equal to 0 if mod x greater than or equal to 2 and in between when a mod x lies between 1 and 2, we k of x will be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1. For all x, The last step is I no longer uh, uh, general we drop the assumption n equals 1. So, let us take any n and let phi of x equal to. So, whatever k I had I will just take k of norm x square. Since the function x going to norm x square, well this is norm x square is just sum of the squares of the coordinates of x. So, it is obviously a C infinity function is C infinity and this k <coughs> is also C infinity by construction, the composition is C infinity, phi is C infinity and let us see we what the values of here, phi of x equal to 1 if norm x 
less than or equal to 1 and v of x equal to 0 if norm x is greater than or equal to since I took norm of x squared in the I will have to put a square root of 2 here. So, I have two concentric balls one of radius 1. So, this is the origin the other one is of radius square root of 2 and my function phi is identically 1 inside the smaller ball and outside the larger ball it is identically 0 in this transition in the sort of annulus between these two balls phi of x is lies between 0 and 1 in fact that is the case for all x. One final remark is that so this completes the uh, construction of the C infinity function actually yeah we have done something more we have constructed a C infinity function with compact support inside a ball and which is identically 1 inside a smaller ball. Note this was done for this specific ball centered at the origin for if one starts with any open set then I can <coughs> what I can do is I can use this phi to define a similar C infinity function on u. In other words, I would want the support of uh, this new function inside to be inside u rather than near the origin. This u might be quite far from the origin. So, u is some set here. Well, this phi that I had constructed all the action took place around the origin, but if I want to move the using this I want to get some similar picture inside u what I all I do is let us just take some point here and p belongs to u and so let me say let let this be open and p belong to u. Since this is open I can find a ball with center p of some radius r such that p so that the ball of radius p which I denote by b r p is contained in u. So, this is p this is r. Now, obviously <coughs> So, and here is our ball of radius 1 and square root of 2. So, phi was supported inside this. I want to move uh, this ball here and define a function here. So, so what I do is let me just take I want if I want to <coughs> use this this uh, ball centered at the origin to define a function based at p well I will just map this ball of radius r to the ball of radius 2. So, in other words 
let t of t from r n to r n b t of x equals first I will do x minus p. So, that p goes to the origin and then <coughs> I want to do some scaling as well. So, that r goes to so, when x minus p equals r I want norm of x minus norm of t x to be square root of 2. So, I just multiply by square root of 2 and divide by r. So, consider this map. So, what this does is t takes p to the origin and t maps the ball of radius r diffeomorphically I mean t is just a linear map plus a constant what is called an, uh, in other words an affine linear map. This r is a constant p is a constant. So, all I am doing is multiplying x by a constant and adding another constant vector. So, it is quite obvious that t is c 1 and its inverse will also be uh, yeah and the point is that t is also it is a linear isomorphism of r n. So, it is inverse is also a linear isomorphism and it is uh, smooth. So, that is whole thing can all but uh, all I care about is it, it is a diffeomorphism T maps B P R diffeomorphically on to the ball of radius 1 centered at the origin. And uh, let C from U to R B c of x is phi of t of x. So, I use this map t if I start with some x here I will use t to come here and then compose with my map phi. So, what uh, this accomplishes is that uh, I will get a c infinity function support of c well actually to be a bit more careful I will have to assume that be such that. So, this ball b p r that I started with in this. Uh, so, this ball that I started with here I want it so that let us assume that its closure is actually inside u. So, I mean all I can or another way of putting it is I start with a ball like this and instead of working with r I work with uh, r by 2 for instance. So, that will do the job. So, with that condition in mind if I take support of C will be <coughs> the closure of this ball and which we assumed in the previous slide is contained in U. And moreover this other ball the ball of radius uh, 1 here gets mapped to also the c of x is equal to 1 on the ball of radius 
well you just have to figure out <coughs> under this map so under the inverse map where does this go to this gets this ball of radius 1 will get mapped to a smaller ball here on BP so I will not write it down so I guess it would be yeah so on BP or not for some the actual value is irrelevant some R not less than R. So, that concludes the preliminaries needed for to begin our study of smooth manifolds. In the next lecture, we will start with the definitions and some examples of manifolds. Thank you.